So here we are with petroleum geology, and I have a list of terms that I've given you, uh, um, you know, the definitions for, but I really wanted to explain them one more time. Now, uh, many of you already understand the structural geology aspects of this class. So you guys know what the hanging wall is and the foot wall and so forth on a fault. Well, very commonly oil will accumulate along either side of a fault and uh, so for instance if there's a bed here or a bed here that may contain oil uh, that would and if there's some sort of like in in water we would call it an aquaclude here we call it a seal so if there's some sort of seal over the top of that the oil could accumulate uh, let's say there's some sort of structure in here it's like something like that and you could have oil accumulating in this sort of feature and you can have the same thing over here as well and so in this case I'm showing you a a fault that's doing this sort of action which would indicate that it's a reverse fault so being a reverse fault you can actually have oil accumulating here and here does it happen sure it does all the time so that is one of the situations so you know what a hanging wall a foot wall is and you know in this case that's a dip slip fault um, that's one term on here uh, the next term we have is anticline and syncline. You know what anticlines are shaped sort of like this. And synclines have this sort of aspect in them as well. They're both folds. This one's a downfold. That's an upfold if you want to call it that. But uh, oil can accumulate in this situation in an anticline as long as it's below some sort of seal. And of course, remember seals are usually shales. Shales tend to be low permeability and low porosity and so they will trap uh, fluids in the subsurface and in this case they're trapping oil. Uh, the way that this works is the oil will migrate in from the sides. Let's say this is a sandstone here, international symbol for sandstone, a bunch of dots, and the oil just migrates up into that structure and this is called a, a uh, structural trap if you will. So the trap itself is below the seal. So the seal is the rock up here, and this is a type of, of anticlinal trap or a structural trap. Now, what about synclines? It's like, well, are they going to be have any? Are they going to have any sort of uh, aspect to them where you can actually uh, trap oil? Sure, yeah. If you have again, you know, some sort of structure, let's say a fault or something like that, you can accumulate oil in the updip limbs, and so updip. Now you have to think about oil and water and how they don't mix. And so in the subsurface in many places you have salt water even. Doesn't matter if it's salt or fresh water, either one of those, the oil is going to float on the, the water. And so the water would be filling most of the porosity, let's say in this sandstone bed here, but the oil will have migrated laterally or some other way up against this fault here. Here you're dealing with a foot wall here. Here's a hanging wall over here. This is a reverse fault, most likely, so that likely has gone up that way, and this is probably uh, going down that way, so that's probably a reverse fault. But anyway, here's your, your trap right here. That's another type of structural trap, a fault trap in this case. But even in a syncline, you can get uh, accumulations like this, so it's not just anticlines like that. That's a type of structural trap. So a fault trap and an anticlinal trap here, uh, very commonly. In very large areas, let's say we have you know a basin shape here. So here's our basin, let's say the Michigan Basin or something like that. And if we looked at a cross section of Michigan, here's Lake Michigan over here, and Lake Huron over here somewhere. In the middle of Michigan, it's like a bullseye in here, and those beds all have an up dip around the, around the perimeter like this. As it turns out, there's also some reefs and things like that that have a lot of porosity around the perimeter and so the oil is migrated out of the basin and into these peripheral sort of settings like this either in faults but the oil will migrate into any sort of up dip structure it can uh, so that's one of the one of the main ones and this is like at Traverse City in Michigan up in northwestern Michigan in the lower peninsula so if Michigan's like this it's up in that part of Michigan right up in here uh, but one of the biggest fields in all of Michigan is like down here in the south central part and it's along a fault, and it's a fault that's had some karstification. So the fault actually, the oil has accumulated in anticline that's been structurally enhanced, if you will. And so that's called the Albion Scipio field in the southern part of the peninsula, so somewhere down in here. So um, 
Yeah, oil can accumulate in structural traps. That's one of the key things that you know already. You know what unconformities are as well. So if you have an angular unconformity, let's say, below this, that's the symbol for uh, an unconformity is that wavy line like that. And let's say we have, you know, sandstone here, or maybe a shale here, and this whole thing was sourced, and the oil can accumulate in a place below that unconformity, because usually at unconformities you have some sort of impermeable sort of layer overlying that unconformity, and so you can actually have an anticlinal unconformity, and this would be regarded as a type of stratigraphic trap as opposed to a structural trap. And so the stratigraphy here is what dictates uh, how the oil and gas may get accumulated in here. Um, and again, the water is going to be pushing up. I'm a, I've got a blue marker here. Let's see, yeah. So the groundwater is going to be pushing up on the bottom of that oil and allowing it to accumulate there. The oil just displa uh, displaces the water then. So uh, this is what they call water drive right there. And the water is by displacing uh, oil, the oil will migrate upward, up dip direction. So the mile, uh, we call it up dip or down dip, right? When, when the oil is going to be lighter of the two, right? And so it'll go in the up dip direction. So that is a type of structural trap here that's associated with, in this case, an angular unconformity. Now, that's just one type of stratigraphic trap there. There's other ones as well. Uh, for instance, I think I mentioned the reefs already with uh, in Michigan. So if you have a, what they call pinnacle reefs there, they're made out of limestone and there's a lot of porosity in these things. Say it's chalky full, but it's made out of limestone for the most part. So limestone can also be a good reservoir of rock as well. And again, this is in a conventional sort of setting. So we're not talking about producing oil or gas out of shale, but we're actually talking about producing it out of the rock to which it's migrated. So I'll give you that story in just a second here. But here we have a reef draped over, let's say, with a shale. And in the case in Michigan, it's actually draped over at the top even more by salts that are in here. So salts would have uh, filled in the basin in, in various places. Here's our salt symbol, the brick pattern, our limestone pattern here. And then uh, <clears throat> here's a shale right here. So the shale would be the seal, but the trap itself, oil will accumulate in this sort of region in here. That's a uh, stratigraphic trap And it's referred to, in this case, as a reef trap. And reefs almost always are made out of limestone, almost always, so a reef trap in this case. So a reef stratigraphic trap. So let's get to the, to the gist of this thing. Okay, so that describes some of the, the trapping settings and some of, the, some of the terms that are on page 22 that you already have definitions to. What is the story of oil? Well, as you know, Rocks get deposited. As rocks get deposited, they accumulate, and accumulate, and accumulate. And you may have different kinds of rocks that accumulate at different times. You may get a sandstone. You may get a limestone. You may get another sandstone at some point, and maybe shales in between. So in this case, here's a stratigraphic succession where you've got all these different strata. If you bury that deeply enough under, let's say, about 3,000 feet of sediment, what happens is all of the organic material that was trapped in these shales like this, and these may be black shales, which are really prone to having organic material in them, they have a lot of algae that may live or die, and when they die, they fall to the seafloor. And once they get buried, it gets hotter and hotter, as you know, in the subsurface, and we call that the geothermal gradient, right? In the geothermal gradient, when you get about 3,000 feet deep and you have organic material that's trapped in a shale like this, it cooks it. And so that process is called maturation. And you can take organic material that may be made out of lipids. It may be made out of like uh, lipid material. There may, be, uh, um, there may be other types of material in there. There, there could be just algae in here. Algonite is, is what they call it when it's ready to be cooked, essentially. So algae, um, wood particles even, wood particles can actually generate gas, as it turns out. Anyway, that material that is in here that's trapped, that may be the complex carbohydrates, the lipids, you know, the fats and so forth. Um, and, and those sort of things, 
they get cooked. And when they get cooked, they become simpler and simpler organic molecules. And so the simplest organic molecule you can have of all of them is CH4. And now that's methane. So methane is a type of hydrocarbon that's natural gas, really. That's the stuff that we burn in the, in the wintertime in this area anyway. So CH4, the most common one. One of the ones that we burn when we have uh, automobiles is we burn octane. Octane is a particular type of, uh, of hydrocarbon that is referred to, uh, well, it has this sort of structure. It has eight carbons in it. All these carbons, one, two, three, yep, all eight of them here. That's the carbons. And they all hook up with the hydrogen. So the hydrogen, let me use a different color here. So the hydrogens are in between here. So the hydrogens are in here. As it turns out, when you ignite this in the presence of oxygen, I'm putting the hydrogens on here. Takes a while to get all eight of them surrounded. So this is a saturated, they call it a saturated hydrocarbon in this case. And uh, the chemical formula for that, of course, is going to be C8. H, and then you just add them up, it's CH18, I think, I think it's right, so it's plus 2, I think, so yeah, so 10 plus 8, yep, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 16, 17, 18, <laughs> yeah. okay, I'm going to have to add some more on there, but anyway, there's a few more um, hydrogens on there. You make the energy when these things uh, break these bonds, and so when you break that bond in the presence of oxygen, you're forming carbon dioxide plus uh, the energy that's given off. And um, anyway, there's your there's your gasoline right there. So C8H16. I think it's 18. Actually, I think it's C18. I have to get. I'll have to like figure this out, but it could be as much as 24. Yeah, I'm, I'm not. I'm not a. I'm not an organic chemist. Okay, but anyway, octane is one of those things that you have in gasoline. It has to go through the maturation process in order to do that. So we take these building blocks, the algae, the wood particles, the resins, and so forth, and those things become the hydrocarbons that eventually, once they get cooked enough, they become mobilized, and so a funny thing happens is if you bury these shales deeply enough. They've already been dewatered a little bit, but what happens is when you get around 3,000 feet, that's kind of a magic number for petroleum maturation, what happens is you actually release water from the structure of the clay particles that are in there. So the clay particles actually generate a little bit of water, and what it does, it tends to float out some of the, hydrogen, some of the hydrocarbons out of that, and so those hydrocarbons will begin to migrate once they go through maturation. Or do they migrate? They migrate upward. Now remember, they're lighter than the water, so they displace the water and they go up lighter. How far do they go? Well, they can go all the way to the surface, and you could have actually a surface seep above a hydrocarbon reservoir. And so that's one way in order to generate the hydrocarbons. The first one that gets generated, of course, is the oil. So the oil is the first one that gets generated. If you keep burying this deeper and deeper in the subsurface, let's say we get around 7,000 feet, we begin to generate the natural gas. And so those are the, the simpler ones come last. And the way that that works then is that, you know, if you keep burying and burying and burying it, so those, the gas particles will come off last here, excuse me. And the gas particles actually will migrate through the oil and the water. And so it makes its way perhaps up to the surface where it may become a gas seep. So anyway, that's the maturation process. So it goes and makes oil first, and then makes natural gas afterwards, and then they migrate. And so when they migrate, they're actually expelled from what we refer to. So these rocks, the shales that have the algae, the woods, and the resins, the things that we refer to actually, the term is kerogens. When you have these kerogens that get cooked, it gets expelled and it migrates, and it's called expulsion. And so it also includes the water that would be expelled with this as well. Where does it migrate to? If it can, it's going to go up dip. So 
that's the uh, that's the gist of the model right here. You have these things deposited at the time of deposition. You have oil and gas that get generated when it gets buried deeply enough in the in the geothermal gradient, and then it becomes expelled at some point. So there is our model for how we generate oil and gas. And very commonly, like if you have a shale that's in a syncline like this or a basin or something like that, that oil tends to have a ability to migrate up dip and not only just in the shale itself, but it'll migrate into the surrounding rocks. And it begins to accumulate then in like anticlines were the number one thing that people drilled for years and years. And so it'll migrate up dip out of a shale and into this sort of setting here where in, a, in an anticline it will trap in that structural trap, the oil and gas. And so what happens is the oil's here, the water drive is down below it, pushing up on this thing. And so it's under pressure, being under pressure. And then the gas gets generated next. And so I want to put the gas in red here. So the gas comes up next. In fact, there's some conventions that people use. So typically water's going to be blue. Natural gas is a, is always in a red color usually, and so green is the color for oil. Usually, I guess they associate it with money. Uh, but here's our natural gas will accumulate. It'll actually migrate through the oil, and into the uh, in the at the top of that oil reservoir here. So the oil. Let me go ahead and I have a a marker here that will suffice for this. So let me go ahead and do that. So here's my oil in here. So oil and gas migrate into structures like that. And uh, in the past, of course, oil has always been more valuable than natural gas. You can buy 1,000 cubic feet of natural gas for a buck or two. For oil, you're going to be paying $25 for 42 gallons of it, right? And so that's, uh, that's today's market price. In the past, it's been upwards of like 150, 200, even more uh, at times. And so when you drill this thing, you have this structure that you may know about. And so when they drill it, where do you want to hit it? Well, you don't want to produce the natural gas because then you either have to put it into a pipeline and sell it. You could do that if you're in the Gulf of Mexico because they have tons of natural gas down there and they have a pipeline system to attach to it. But you'd prefer to drill in here. In the old days, they would drill a vertical well and you'd have a certain pay zone that you would have here where the oil... Uh, it was being pushed by the water. If you have water down there, forget about it. You have essentially what they would call a dry hole, even though it has water in it. So that is what they aim for. They try to produce as much oil and gas as they can, but mostly oil if they can. So, um, okay, so I used to work for a couple of oil companies. One of them was for Exxon, well, it was before the merger. So I worked for Mobile for two summers. One summer I spent in the Western Rockies in Wyoming uh, doing some field stratigraphy for them and looking for reservoir rock. And there, the seal in that situation was an anhydrite. Uh, for the other uh, opportunity I had to work in a summer for Mobile, it was in, in uh, Dallas, Texas. And that was pre-merger, of course, but th that was looking at some rocks in the Gulf of Mexico and uh, looking for potential for... Uh, for where these things would actually pinch out. And so um, that's a situation right here where it shows you how it migrates into a structure. Um, there are other types of structures and pinch outs are one of those things. And so when people look for uh, oil and gas, if you have an unconformity below and an unconformity above, the oil may go up dip and fill in the tips of these unconformities like this, and you'd have another reservoir here. Okay, so now you know a petroleum source rock is a rock, it's usually a shale, and it's organic rich. That's our petroleum source rock. That's where the oil and gas get generated once it goes through the maturation process. Petroleum source rocks forever have been considered the source for all of the oil reservoirs around the world. And most people who look at conventional reservoirs, they're really looking at sandstones and limestones and maybe a conglomerate or two here and there. And uh, that's pretty rare and had to have it in conglomerate. But limestones and shales, excuse me, sandstones were the most common. Those are the conventional reservoirs.
Now today, because of the new technology that George Mitchell was able to put together, people actually go out and they look for the shales now, these organic rich black shales. And what they do is they drill down and then horizontally into that shale. And then they frack it along the distance and that could run up to two miles or so along a run uh, this way. And they may do that in two different directions because you can, you can actually guide these uh, drill rigs now. You can dr guide the head of it and it can tell you exactly what type of rock you're drilling into. And so people who do that sort of work, they're called geo steering engineers. And a lot of those guys are actually geologists, but geo steering is what you do in the subsurface to guide the drill rig. And it's more like playing a video game these days. And so people who do that make a lot of money. Well, except when the market is down like it is right now, um, but it'll come back at some point. So that is the unconventional reservoirs. If the conventional were the sandstones and limestones and conglomerate, the unconventional are the organic rich black shales. And so people go directly to a petroleum source rock now to produce oil and gas. Okay, so you drill laterally like this, and they set off small charges. To, uh, they, they have production tubing that they put into the borehole. These boreholes are probably somewhere between 8 and 13 inches. It depends on where you're at in the thing. And so they're usually around 8 or 10 inches. Um, so the borehole runs 8 or 10 inches wide. They set off, uh, they, they, they line it with some tubing, and then they set off some charges to puncture that tubing and to puncture the rock around it. And then they introduce the, the uh, fracking fluids, and the fracking fluids are, are introduced under high pressure. And so they back a truck up to the system and they flush it full of sand plus the fracking fluids and it breaks the rock around it and allows the oil and gas that may be trapped in that petroleum source rock to enter the borehole then and then you can produce out of the borehole then and so every oil well is producing out of these boreholes that are drilled. Um, so that's a petroleum source rock that's uh, geosteering and that's an unconventional resource and these petroleum source rocks are the new Excuse me, this is conventional. These are the unconventional resources right here. And uh, let me see how far that gets us down the, the top here from these, uh, the list of things here. Um, a gas cap you will recognize as being the gas that's trapped at the top of a reservoir. So a gas cap would be the gas up at the top with the oil below that and the water below that. And so that is referred to as the water drive down below where the water is pushing up on the whole thing, the gas cap at the top. So you will have gone through a later phase of maturation in this case. So probably a little bit deeper than 3,000 feet then. Um, so you know a structural trap, you know a stratigraphic trap. Uh, conate water is water trapped at the time of deposition. So very commonly conate water will be salt water. And so because many of these are marine deposits across even the United States, um, the marine waters were trapped at the time of deposition. That's called conate water, C-O-N-N-A-T-E, conate water. Um, other things to tell you about, we know about the oil and gas maturation. We know about burial. We know about the petroleum source rock. Petroleum exploration, simply looking for oil and gas in the subsurface. You know about structural trap, uh, st traps now. You know about stratigraphic traps. Uh, we know about water drive gas cap. You know how to drill it. Um, we're down to the drilling technologies actually next. That involves another famous person actually. You probably heard of him, Howard Hughes. Howard Hughes developed the Baker Hughes Tool Company, actually it was the, the Hughes Tool Company to begin with. And uh, so in the old days, as you recognize in a borehole, if this is the surrounding rock that it's already been drilled into, in the old days they used to use cable tools and they would just hammer it out and then bail the rock out of it like that. Um, somebody came up with a very clever design where in a drill stem, you could actually attach a drill bit to the very bottom down here with some cones on it like this. And so cones were added to the bottom and these would have little chisels essentially at the bottom and put them on a, a rotor. And so what they would do is they would spin up this hollow pipe right here, which is called the drill stem. And this would be the rotary drill bit at the bottom down here. And this thing would crush the rock 
and jets would blast out the material. Drilling fluids were circulated down through that hollow pipe and because you've already drilled a hole, you know, you're at the bottom of this hole crushing that rock with this rotary drill bit, the, the, the cuttings would instead be flushed out the side around the sides of that the drill stem here. And so those cuttings make it all the way to the surface where they are rinsed and they recycle the muds back down the hole this way. Uh, so drilling muds would be forced through the bottom of this thing on a big pump at the very top of a drill rig. And it, it's heavy enough. Drilling mud has barite in it. And so as you know, barite has a, a massive uh, specific gravity and so it's able to float many of the rock chips that were cut on these rotary drill rigs. So Hughes came up with this idea of doing a, I think it was a, a two-headed version of this first and then today of course they do a three-headed uh, version of this or more. They, they can do multiple heads at the bottom down here and it allows to, to crush and, and, and uh, really just destroy the rock in that borehole. So if you're drilling down here that may be and if you're down at the bottom of a hole, maybe eight inches across or something like that down here. And so you're drilling uh, through the reservoir that way. So that's the old style anyway. So that's a rotary drill bit right here. And rotary drilling would have a rotary bit at the top. They still do that. They still do that. But now when they're drilling, they want to have these sort of devices that will actually, they're programmable essentially, or you can have a geosteering engineer come in and and mark the direction. Okay, we want to go this way and we want to go up, we want to go down and with a joystick, he can actually guide this thing. So there's going to be a whole string of instruments behind that drill rig right now. And it could be up to like 20 plus feet of, of instruments that are behind the drill bit now as you're drilling laterally. Um, so really quite an interesting process. So it's a marvel of modern engineering really when it comes right down to it. Um, other things to tell you about, um, one of the things that they're very careful about, at least they should be careful about, is when you're at the, sub, at the surface up here and you have your drill rig up in here, and here's a drilling platform up here about 28 feet or so above the, uh, the land surface. Here's the land surface right here. And they've begun to spin this thing down. And so as you're drilling through, remember there's going to be aquifers up in here, right? Well, those aquifers are precious, right? In many places around the world, there's not a whole lot of groundwater that's uncontaminated. So what they have to do is they have to put a jacket around the drill stem here. What they'll do is they cement it and they put what they call casing in it. And so casing will protect the shallow groundwater uh, from being contaminated. And of course, most of this is the freshwater at the very top. Down here at the bottom, it's gonna be more uh, saline. And so this conate water that's trapped down here at great depth salt water already, so they don't worry about it quite so much. Uh, but they always will case a well after they've drilled it. So once they're past about, let's say, a, well, probably about four, yeah, three or 4,000 feet. Yeah, they, you know, surface casing is much shallower than that, usually a few hundred feet. But then uh, they'll case the entire well and then produce out of, out of, out of intervals where they've actually blasted um, laterally to fracture the rock and allow the oil to come back into the borehole. And then they'll, they'll plot, you know, if the oil's coming up from a certain area, they'll plug it up uh, below that so the oil doesn't get trapped in the borehole. So they'll cement it in. So that is the way that a lot of oil gets produced. So production is the idea that you can take oil that you find in the subsurface through exploration. If it's a proven well, uh, you can come back and then you can produce out of it. Uh, ideally, they want wells that will actually flow. Now, flowing wells don't happen very commonly. They have to be under a lot of pressure in order to, to be able to flow. So typically what they have to do is put a pump jack at the very top and that's going to be able to provide a suction and then they can suck all the oil out of the borehole that way. If it is under enough pressure where uh, as you're drilling, the pressure could be so great that it would actually cause the, uh, the natural gas, let's say if you get natural gas, or oil for that matter, if it's under an enormous amount of pressure, uh, it may blow out at the top. And so that's why they have things called blowout preventers uh, in the stack in a pit uh, just below these oil rigs like this. And so a blowout preventer comes in and shuts the gate essentially in any oil or, or any other sort of pressure that you may hit in the subsurface. So here we are back again and uh, 
when I last was talking with you, we were talking about uh, blowout preventers and how blowout preventers can cause um, keep the overpressure zones from actually uh, contaminating the surface or the the seafloor in, in the case of the Deepwater Horizon well that blew out in 2012, 2011 and uh, killing 10, 10 or 12 people on the rig. Um, but I think it was a it was a deep water rig and uh, yeah it went down um, and then the uh, and then there was a huge environmental catastrophe associated with it as well. So there are always there are always consequences to any type of, of petroleum exploration and production. And uh, so environmentally, you can be done soundly, but people who cut corners uh, sometimes can cause real uh, major accidents and people can get killed. Uh, that happens a lot actually in the in the oil business more than you would imagine. So um, what I want to talk with you a little bit about is what happens when you produce from a well. These things you've probably seen before they're called pump jacks. Pump jacks are they can be fairly large if it's a deep oil that they're trying to, to create the suction for. And this thing has what they call a slick rod or slicker rod and a uh, sucker rod down below that. And so there's a, a ball pump that's in these things, fairly simple sort of construction. And uh, on the downstroke, it, it uh, pushes the oil and out of it. And then on the upstroke, it pulls the oil into the, sort of the, uh, the vacuum pump there, essentially. It's a, it's a reservoir. <clears throat> so uh, in the subsurface, when you're using a pump jack like this, remember that there's a water drive below the oil that's pushing upward on it eventually you're going to begin to produce water and that's called produced waters. And so produced waters have to be dealt with. And so what happens in fact is you get, uh, you get water mixed with oil and oftentimes they will actually do what they call, um, well, they, they, they have these stock tanks that are put around these sort of pump jacks like this. And in the first one, on that upstroke, when it pulls that product out of the well, out of the, of the borehole, out of this uh, capacity, this, this area right in here. Um, it's going to ha have that mixture of oil and water and they put it into a separator. And so the oil will flow to the top and be siphoned off and they'll have uh, an area for oil and an area for the water. Uh, and so they come along, they collect the water uh, very kind of, they'll collect the oil too and take it to market that way. And, uh, and big trucks, big tanker trucks will do that. Uh, if it's a large enough oil field, they'll actually build a pipeline to it. And the pipeline will bring uh, uh, crude oil all the way into the refinery that way. Uh, but for the case of the water, what do you do with the water? Now this is water that likely is conate water, conate water being deposited, accumulating at the time of deposition, right? So usually salt water in these uh, sedimentary rocks. And so because shallow oceans cover much of North America, right? So that salt water gets extracted. And then what do you do with the salt water once you've uh, produced it? Well, you, you can put it over into another well that doesn't have a pump jack on it, and they call them injection wells. And they can put that water back into the subsurface. Now they try to protect the shallow water um, <clears throat> aquifers again by having a good casing at the top. In fact, they'll case these wells all the way down. Uh, but they find a, an injection interval where they try to produce more oil from uh, that injected water. And so that water can actually add to the water drive that's below the reservoir. And so they inject the water. Um, it's, a, it's a waste treatment, if you will. So it's oily water that gets injected into the subsurface. Now this is way below drinking water sort of area. So nobody, you know, nobody's really worried about it, right? Until recently, because there have been a lot of injection wells associated with horizontal rigs that, um, you know, if you have a horizontal well, you're still going to have a pump jock at the top like this eventually, you know, to produce the oil out. And there still may be water that's produced. And so what do you do with that water? Well, they pump it back into that producing interval. And the trouble is, of course, is that it's under pressure when you inject it. And as you inject it, you can actually activate old faults and things like that. So there's an issue with earthquakes that they've never had before in places like Oklahoma, Arkansas, and a few other places where they do this sort of you know, activity. Um, for Arkansas, they decided to ban any sort of injection wells. And so they said, no more. We're not going to put up with the earthquakes around Little Rock. 
And so they stopped it there. Oklahoma makes most of their money off of the oil industry, and so they didn't ban it there. And so as a consequence of that, you're getting 5.7, 5.8 earthquakes in Oklahoma in a place that historically has never had anything larger than uh, a magnitude three earthquake. So uh, injection, particularly these wastewater injection wells seem to be what's driving many of the earthquakes in places like Oklahoma. And we knew it would do that actually from the 1970s when there were injection wells um, in Rocky Flats out in, uh, in Colorado, which had injection wells and they were having a lot of seismicity associated with it. So anyway, that's the, uh, the story of produced water and what you do with it and how things get taken to, to market. So there is a big dichotomy in the oil industry between where you produce the oil and gas in the oil fields and once it's taken to the refinery. And so the part where you actually find the oil and produce the oil is referred to as upstream. So upstream, that's what companies do. They, they have companies that will like say, well, let's find the oil. And they, they, they build their geologic models, try to figure out what kind of trap it is, what the seal is, what the timing of the charge is for how the oil migrated to a certain place. And then um, for the downstream folks, they're more concerned about when this material is taken to the refinery and then what happens after that. So in a refinery, this is a, a kind of a diagram of what happens there during the distillation process. So that's the first thing that happens is in distillation, they put it into a column, they heat up the oil and gas, low temperatures, and they, they drive off the various products. Well, the lightest products go to the very top and are collected up at the very top. And so they'll siphon off the product at the top. And then uh, in addition to that, you may have gasoline, you may have heptane, you may have pentane, you may have all these various molecules. And towards the bottom down here, you're collecting many of the heavier um, hydrocarbons. And so you may wind up with motor oil or something equivalent to motor oil down here. And then you may have asphalt at the very bottom. So asphalt would then be taken to a, a place where you could use that product. And so they use the various products, so plastics somewhere in the middle there. Um, so that's what they do at a refinery. That's one of the processes they use there. The other one's called cracking. And so in cracking, they take long molecules, the long hydrocarbons, and they break them in half essentially with in the presence of catalysts. And so cracking results in uh, the usefulness being increased from the crude oil. Now, okay, so one of the one of the key things is how much gasoline can you get out of a barrel of oil? And, and it varies on the kind of oil it is, but in general, you get about 23 gallons of gasoline out of every barrel of oil that is produced. Now, some oils are better than others, so the lighter oils tend to be tend to produce more gasoline. And in fact, there are some wells in Indonesia that produce almost stuff you could burn in your vehicle directly out of the well. Um, it's, it's called gas condensate. Gas condensate is a very lucrative sort of product to, uh, to produce. Uh, Mobile, when I was working for them, had a well in Indonesia that was giving them about a million dollars a day, or maybe a field, about a million dollars a day. Um, okay. So once you've refined it, you got to take it to market. When you take it to market, what does that mean? Well, it winds up at the gas stations, right? So from the refinery, it goes to bulk stations or it gets piped around the, the, the U.S. in the pipeline infrastructure that we have. And so from refinery to the market, there will be bulk stations. There's two of them in the Springfield area. There's one in Brookline. There's one in Mount Vernon. Um, and that bulk stations are where the the trucks go to pick up their gasoline, their product loads. And then about 8,200, 8, 8,400 gallons uh, in a tanker like that. And then they take it to market to, to the gas stations that are around Springfield and other surrounding areas. So all of this area is, is supplied by those two um, uh, bulk stations. They have tanks and things like that there that have the various products that people use, diesel, uh, unleaded gasoline, and then they have all the other products. And so most of the products are almost always the same. There's a few refineries that will put some additives in um, to the uh, refined gasoline, but uh, that's pretty uncommon. So most of the gas stations you stop at has the same gas as the other gas station. The only thing you have to worry about, here's a little bit of advice, never fill up at a gas station when you see a tank truck there, because what that does when they're, when they're dropping into the, the 
underground storage tanks for the gasoline. They have submersible pumps that go into them. Uh, when they do that, it stirs up the tanks. And so if there's any water or condensate in those tanks, it's going to make it a little bit dirtier or a little bit wetter, if you will, with water um, when, they're, uh, when they're actually refilling those tanks. So if you see a tanker there, wait a while, wait, wait a few hours before you go fill up. Otherwise, you're probably going to get minute traces of water in your gas. Um, other things to keep in mind, oh, well, there's little things actually, like uh, fill up on cold days if you can, and that way the gas hasn't expanded as much in the tank, so you get more for your uh, your money that way. Um, just a little bit, not much. I mean, the, the, the tank's usually going to be about the same temperature, but if you're outside and it's warmer, it's, it's easier to like uh, lose some of it through vaporization, stuff like that. Okay, so that's the market. So this is the downstream part, right? So the major oil companies were really smart about this, right? So they wanted a vertically integrated corporation. They would have an upstream and they would have a downstream that they could market at. And so that's why places like Phillips still have exploration and production companies, but they also have the downstream market. So the Phillips stations where they can actually market their own product that way. Um, and they're affiliates usually. And so these are people who have franchises and they will you know, pay for their franchise and, and have to buy their allotment from that company um, usually. And so that's the, that's the way that system sort of works. Um, so yeah, so the refinery produces all these products um, and you use it. And many people use it anyway. Anybody who drives is part of this system. Um, so I have one more uh, short bit to put into an MP3 and tell you a little bit about the last parts of the oil and gas system and how we've moved from, you know, from different resources and, and different uses for hydrocarbons through the ages. Um, I'll record that next, but I'm going to go ahead and try to upload this video first. Um, other things to tell you about here. Um, for the offshore areas, the federal government leases many of those properties. So we actually have uh, uh, leases that go out in, in the waters, the surrounding waters, the 200 mile limit for the US uh, exclusive economic zone, any leases that are made that brings money into the federal government. I used to work for the USGS. Uh, I worked for ExxonMobil as well. And so, um, and then I've, uh, I guess those, that's the only company I've worked for mobile for two summers. Actually, I worked for Shell for one summer as well. So um, interesting education. Uh, it gives you a lot of insight into the markets and, uh, and the, uh, the different aspects of the petroleum business. Um, it's not without its, its uh, detractors, obviously, but until we invent another system by which we can distribute goods around the world like we do today, it's probably going to be remaining in place. It would be nice to have alternative energies, but even many of the alternative energies, if you watch the documentary um, that I've posted the link to as, as well, you'll see that many of those are burdened with sort of ecological sort of conundrums as well. So um, here we have petroleum, and I will, um, I will finish this off right now and just tell you that I'll add a little bit more to a second MP3. and. Um, and we'll talk a little bit later. Um, I'll give you uh, probably a little bit of a review uh, at some point in here. And um, so this is the 2nd of May right now that I'm recording this. Um, the final, I think, is on Wednesday, the following week. And so we will um, we'll take it as it comes. Anyway, anyway it takes about <laughs> 10 times longer to, to do these like presentations on the blackboard here than it does in real class. So I'm sorry for that. Hopefully I haven't talked too much. But anyway, I hope you'll also be able to get a lot of useful information out of this. So anyway, talk to you soon. Thanks.